1976, just 40 years back, when I was relatively, I was young, I just started my research. So I'm very, very thankful to the organizers of the NIT, this function, for inviting me and getting the opportunity to interact with you. Kerala, you know, has given so much to India right from the time of Adi Shankara to numerous nation builders who were very, very active, had played such an important role, you know. So it's always an honor to be in Kerala. Now, the historians uh, live or survive through conflict. Conflict is a part of historical process. Now, the time is short. And history is full of materials, both very pleasant and unpleasant. So given that, given the constraint of time, I'll try to be as brief and precise as possible. I'll first define what is history. And I'll, again, once again, tell you that I have always uh, found interacting with students uh, with engineering, mathematics background, always very fruitful, you know. So I always enjoy talking to people like you. What is history? First, I'll define it in very briefly. History, to put it very, very simply, is a record of past events, things which had happened in past. How it happened, why it happened, and who are the actors, dramatists, persona involved in that, you know. So is basically a story of things which had happened in the past, but not all stories. Say so many people have visited Calicut for any time you remember, including my visit last night. But people would not remember that. But when Vasco de Gama visited Calicut in 1498, that becomes a major event of history, isn't it? The very distinguished historian from Kerala, Sadar Panikar, had wrote an entire book on that, how it inaugurates the age of Western influence. So things which are important from a larger point of view are to be recorded by the historian. Now, the problem begins when the historian, he or she, tries to uh, avoid things which don't fit into the mold in which he or she has been trained. Very bluntly, it is very difficult to do, but most historians, the history that you have studied, say, in class 12, I'm sure you have studied history up to class 12, that there's a pattern, there's a policy, agenda set by the government what kind of things are to be taught to the students, you know. So certain matters are considered taboo, certain matters are to be highlighted. And this issue of different lenses crop up here. I will say mention the, one of the most important chapters of the class 12 history book on freedom movement. I won't name the author of this page, this article, 29 pages article, is known as a historical cricket. And he's always there writing all kinds of things, you know. He writes that. Just briefly, you know, this Len says things. A 29 pages chapter on Fuda movement, on every page the mention of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi. Every page, including the question answer, last two things, you know, fine. Now, Gandhi was a great man. He played a very, very important role. We don't deny his role. But then there are other people also who are very important. Where people like Rajgopalachari, Subhash Chandra Bose are dismissed in half a line as younger colleagues of Gandhi. Is this history? Okay. So you judge for yourself. So from this, say, just example, I move on to the larger issue say, the various issues in history, right from ancient time to medieval time to modern time, contemporary times, you know. We don't have the time to talk about every aspect. So one thing which all of you understand, which is also related to the contemporary politics of India, is that who all contributed to the achievement of India's independence in 1947. 
you know. Now, the 15th August 1947, British handed over power to Indians. That is a fact, isn't it? So that's a fact of history. We don't deny it. The problem begins, the lenses, problem of lenses, how you look at it begins when you're asked to write and then answer to get good marks is that who all were very important, most important in India's freedom movement. The two groups, mainly one is those who believed in non-violence, passive resistance, those who believed in fast and things like that. Simply we call them the Gandhians, isn't it? That's one. Second group is people who did not believe in non-violence, who were revolutionaries, who took up arms against the British. So there is mainly two strands. Yet our history textbooks, the PhD research textbooks, everything tend to focus on the contribution of the people who followed the peaceful methods of agitation. Fine. The point is that if you take off your lenses, you will see that this is not the truth. The revolutionaries, those who took up arms, they also contributed equally, if not more, to the other group. But this story has been consciously suppressed, smothered, you know. So problem begins here. By the way, I'm in Kerala. Have you heard of the name of, uh, say, Nambiar Sahib? Nambiar, how many of you have heard of name Nambiar? Anyone, students? Not the senior history. Nambiar, I just uh, reviewed a book uh, by Nambiar. Should come out any day now. Written by also a Kerala police officer, Balachandran. Is very much in the news. Now, who was Nambiar? You see, you don't know why. He was the most important associate of Subhash Chandra Bose in Europe. Why you don't know? We should know. We should have known. He was the man selected by Subhash Chandra Bose when he visited Europe in 1930s. He was a young journalist working in Paris. Got in touch. And then 41, when Subhash Chandra Bose left, quietly left India, as you know the stories, how he came to Germany, he was looking for one man, one young Indian. Who was that? And Berlin was a very important center of revolutionaries, Indian revolutionaries. He picked up Nambiar, was the 20s. Nambiar, and Nambiar had been expelled from Germany because he was anti-Nazi also, you know. Subhash Chandra Bose brought him here, and he was his deputy for, till he left for South Asia, Singapore in 1942. And he went, took that famous epic submarine voyage. He put Nambiar Sahab in charge of the Indian mission in Berlin. So Nambiar is such a hero. Now there are stories about him now. Balachandran has written whether he was a spy or not, fine. Who's spy? But for the period he was with Subhash Chandra Bose, that's a very, one of the important stories in our freedom movement. Why that story is not there? You say, so bright students of NIT, Calicut don't know. It is not your fault. You have not been told about it. So this is what we mean by distorted history, you know. So I'll come, I'll explain this point. There's no point, uh, uh, no time to explain various issues in, in history, you know. Please, who will tell me my time? Uh, I have spent about five minutes. How much more time do I have? Give me a, uh, so you said 15 minutes, so I should have about 10 minutes left. How much time do you have? Another 10 minutes or so? Five minutes, good. Okay. So, uh, you know, it, it is this kind of distortion which should be avoided. And why it is important and how it has to be done? The historian has to be without bias. And historian has to go by empirical facts. Like students of engineering mathematics, history is also a subject based on empirical evidence. Good history must be based on evidence, evidence which is known, which is credible. You can't say, okay, this is what I taught in school and college. If I write this, my professor will give me good marks. If I do this, I will get a fellowship. No, that's, that's not criteria. That is politics. That is ideology. So historians, the way you work in the lab, labs, you know, isn't it? You keep experimenting with things, matters, established facts. 
Similarly, historians have to deal with his established facts, you know. And this is what many historians unfortunately don't do, you know. So there are issues whether Aryans came to India, outsiders or not. Debate goes on. <coughs> now, there's no credible evidence of any sort to say that Aryans were outsiders. They invaded India. Nothing has been. 10 minutes? Go good. OK, fine. OK, thank you so much. <laughs> Now, this is how, you know, now, so there's a history behind that. Why it was done? They said British had deliberately injected this idea that Aryans were invaders, isn't it? Point was that to tell Indians, especially the Hindus, you know, that you have been slaves, you know, you have been ruled by outsiders because you yourselves are outsiders. So now you are ruled by the British, Europeans. Before that, you are ruled by invaders from Central Asia, Persia, Arab, Afghanistan, people like that. So because that is also your history, your invaders, you know. So this is how politics is injected history. But now a lot of research has been done last 20, 30 years. Except Indian historians, unfortunately, most of the scholars based in American universities, British, they have rejected this theory, theory of Aryan invasion, like that, you know. Yet we hold on to that. Say, I'll take up one, one of uh, uh, two more issues, you know. It is said that, OK, uh, Hindus persecuted a Buddhist. This is deliberately done in history textbooks, you know. There's so no proof of that. You know, these names, Priyadarshi, Tathagat, Amitav, Supriya, I can name hundreds of names, which are very popular names in Hindu households. Noted that? Why? If Hindus and Buddhists are fought, then why the Buddhist name should be so common? When say, if when Chinese entered, invaded Tibet in 1959, when His Holiness Dalai Lama found shelter in India, Tibetans are Buddhist. And where did they come? They came to India. They didn't go to Pakistan, isn't it? They didn't go to Afghanistan. Why? If the relations between the Hindus and Buddhists were so bad, then why they should come here? I'll give you one more example. Area called Chittagong Hill Tracks, which is now in Bangladesh. I've done a book on that many years back. Which had 97% Buddhist population in 1947. So when India was being divided, it, the matter you know, came up which area should join Pakistan, east or west. So Chittagong Hill Tracks, 97% Buddhist population, they said we'll join India, not Pakistan. Why? Because they found more comfortable living with a country which, where the Hindus have a majority. Yet 14th, till 14th August, Sardar Patel, Mountbatten, Governor General Nehru Panditji said, OK, you will join with us. Suddenly, one night, decision was that it should be given to Pakistan. It becomes part of East Pakistan. And severe persecution of the Buddhists begin there. The 97 percent Buddhist population 1947, now they are less than 40%. Why this happens, you know? So there are lessons in history. The point is, we refuse to take lessons in history. And those who refuse to take lessons from history, they pay the price. And we as a nation are happily paying the price because we refuse to learn history. Oh, no, 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 yes, no, you shouldn't say this, you shouldn't say this. Number come mil jayega. Job name milega, things like that, you know. So it is this kind of attitude which has to be, say, avoided. Otherwise, you have no future. Because I said history, like engineering, like research in pharmacology, has an applied dimension, isn't it? You for studying engineering, you will innovate, isn't it? You invent, you add to the process of constructing a thing. Similarly, historians' job is also like that. They are also providing an insight into the past. Things which had gone wrong, things which were right. They deal with people who are visionaries. They deal with people who are myopic, who couldn't see up beyond their own interest. It's the story of the great and the good. But how am I going to do an honest job 
if i say no no i like this person because if i glorify this person is going to help me i'll become vice chancellor if lucky i can become governor also no so so this is not history this is politics you see to get a job to get scholarship get money is different thing than writing authentic history i'll give you just two or three examples from history you know say my father's generation uh so went to schools british schools 1920s 1930s my father was going to school he used to study in a missionary school christian mission is there what book they studied in history you know book by rc dat ramesh chandra dat i think students of history know he wrote the famous book economic history of india who was the second indian to get into indian civil service four indians got into civil service ics he is a president of the indian national congress and a great writer and his book history textbook was taught to students and you know what was there in the first page of the book mother and motherland it begins first page you will see libraries says the poet a greater than heaven which is the translation of the sanskrit lines janani janma bhumisha swargadapi kariyasi so <laughs> look this was taught even in the british days where janani janma bhumisha mother and motherland were glorified now in some universities in north india you see uh, you know they say bharat ka barbad ho tukda ho this is being taught why because they had been taught like this so again it is a very point not that british are always doing bad things british gave us that history which we will be scared of doing now they said oh this army ye hai this is not a revolutionary like us so you know uh, the point is uh, that but then how do we get authentic history to get an authentic history the professional integrity is very important but then when so much depends on state funding this state government state which controls the syllabus which prescribe the textbooks so you just can't say no to the minister or to the chairman who ever is so problem begins here but then one simple easy way out is that you have to read you have to pick and choose your own history whatever is taught is taught you can't do anything even i can't do a thing even i was not happy all my 42 years i taught in delhi university mod i used to tell my students look most of the textbooks prescribe i'm not happy with them but if you follow what i say 100% then you may get bad marks do after 20 years when you join active life probably say na mukherji sir ne oh okay he was very correct but that is not help you what you need is to get good marks isn't it rational thinking so please and you have no say what kind of history textbook people will do so please read literature good literature biographies autobiographies like that you know and then you get a vision of it that is very important you see 1962 war we are badly humiliated badly defeated again unfortunately you know vk krishnan from this land was a defense minister <laughs> okay fine there's a difference to it all together and why you lost because pandit nehru had no understanding with defense matters he was building up himself you know but if you look back at history bipin chandra pal one of those early nationalist lala lajpat rai bal ganga tilak bipin chandra pal 99 he had said this this is a danger we should be scared of china he had warned 100 years back sardar patel as deputy prime minister 1959 to 1950 is writing a long letter to pandit nehru look the chinese are building roads we must do something about it they are coming close to india pandit nehru thought he will get a nobel prize he was drawing of hindi chini bhai bhai he slept over the matter so this is precisely what you don't do you know i just end with one or two more examples you know that i often found that 
you get a very good sense of history, not from history textbook, kind of textbook which are taught in India. I particularly mention uh, this book. The American author called Robert Canigal. Have you heard his name? You must read it. Your library should have this. Have you heard of this book? Canigal uh, wrote a book titled The Man Who Knew Infinity. That is Ramanujam, the famous mathematician, the genius who died so young, you know, went to Cambridge, who was a clerk, he began his life as a clerk in Madras Port Trust. And then he was in touch with some Cambridge mathematicians while he sent his papers. Then he said, my God, he's a genius. He's rotting as a clerk in Madras Port, Port Trust. Unfortunately, Ramanujam didn't live long. But if you read this life of a mathematician from in Madras, they in Madras. By an American, you will see what kind of a story is. This is real stuff, you know. I have known more about, say, Tamil or South Indian life from this book than the many history books I had to study, you know. So keep your readings very open and wide. I know you're very hard pressed. Engineering students have to work very hard, you know, long hours, laboratory, and things like that. Yet, you should find time to do extra reading. Even, you know, books written from a very contrary point of view, they give you an insight. Because you catch the lie. This, you, your logic says, no, this can't be true, you know. You can't say that beyond a point only Gandhiji fought for Indian independence. Subhas Bose did nothing, Bhagat Singh did nothing, Surya Sen did nothing. You can't. So the lie is exposed. The point is. So the point is that if all purpose of education is to develop, yeah, I finished, uh, an holistic approach, a comprehensive attitude to life, you have to keep your minds and ears very, very open. I thank you once again for inviting me and giving the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for giving me patient hearing. Please allow me to sit and speak here since I can't stand up for a long time. I was um, asked to speak about the differing views on history, especially the history of India. Well, this is a very vast subject. And there, are, there's, there's, there is no focus. I was expecting that there will be a working paper on which you can comment, but that is not there. So I will speak about some of my views on history and the history of India in particular. Uh, many persons who deal with history speak about rulers, kings, commanders, ministers, reformers, religious leaders, etc. Do they create history? I am not sure. They are, of course, there. They, they lived in various places. But if you had the power of recreating a, a, a person who lived in the subcontinent of India in the 17th century, and if you asked him or her about India, uh, he would be surprised. He will be embarrassed because there was no India. No person till the establishment of the British uh, Empire in India had any concept of India. India did not exist till the 19th century. If a person lived in Maharashtra, he might have heard of Shivaji and the rulers, the Maratha rulers. Or if it is in Mysore, he might have heard of uh, Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan and others. If he lived in or about Delhi, some of the rulers in Delhi, that's all. They, they never heard of a thing called India. Nobody wrote about India. No India existed until the British, uh, with their uh, military movements and um, uh, political diplomatic activities, brought together the various parts of the Indian subcontinent and created a state of India. That was the beginning. So India comes into existence only in the 19th century. Till then, there were many small states and big states, some empires, a Mughal Empire was there, and the Maratha Empire was there. Before that, there were sultanates in, in Delhi. That's all. 
but no India. Nobody had ever heard of a kingdom or a state called India. Only with the 19th century we have to begin. And then the next question that I would like to uh, deal with here is, how is history made? And what is history? You cannot go back in history. You cannot experiment with history in the laboratory and bring back the past. The past is past, gone forever. We have to depend on what some people have written during the earlier centuries about what they knew and what they witnessed. That is, some records are there. That is one thing. Another way is to look at the uh, remnants, the relics of forts, palaces, temples, uh, churches, uh, mosques, etc. And then study from them as to what existed. Uh, in both cases, it will be arbitrary, piecemeal, and fragmentary also. You, can't, you can never uh, reconstruct the whole entire thing. But the, the question was raised in the 19th century, when uh, some thinkers thought that like physical uh, material sciences like chemistry and physics, history must also be made into a science. There must be social sciences like the physical sciences. So history can also be made into a science. If it is to be made into a science, then there must be some general laws. So thinkers like Karl Marx, for example, uh, thought that it would be possible to, uh, to create laws or to uh, delineate certain laws. So what is, the, what is the motive force of history? If not individuals, great or small, criminals or great man, uh, reformers, then who? What is the uh, motivating factor in history? Uh, people like Marx thought that history is made by the people for their existence. A large society has to exist. And to exist, they must have food, they must have um, uh, living space and uh, they must have dwelling places, they must have places of worship. So those people, what, how do they do this? There are natural um, raw materials and these raw materials have to be transformed into consumable commodities or articles. See, food has to be created from grains, the grains have to be cultivated, harvested and then made into eatable form that has to be distributed. So it is this labor, by human labor, you transform uh, the raw materials in nature into consumable goods for man. And it is this process which uh, uh, may, may creates history. And that goes on changing also. Uh, there is a strange factor that throughout the past, uh, the people who <coughs> contributed the most in order to make uh, people live, uh, eat, uh, and um, have their daily existence, they don't enjoy the fruits of their labor. The fruits of labor are uh, confiscated by a small minority of people. It may be the landlords at one time, maybe the industrialists, uh, the capitalists at another time. It may be some sort of other, other people know. Oh, they were a minority and they succeeded all the time throughout history. Many attempts have been made from the time of the French Revolution onwards to uh, create equality, liberty and fraternity, but it has never been achieved. Uh, in 1917, uh, <coughs> the Russian Revolution uh, occurred and they believed that they had created a new world, a new society with equality. but. That was a, an illusion. There was no equality, there was no liberty, and the Russian people themselves destroyed the Soviet Union by 1992. Earlier, the trouble had started much earlier. So you, you find that though human beings create values, create wealth out of their labor, they don't enjoy it themselves. Somebody else knocked off uh, uh, the uh, wealth that is created. And this differed from time to time. And what we call history 
is not a matter of opinion. Though many people, when, in, when they write about history, they think this historian is of this opinion, that historian has another opinion. It's not a matter of opinions at all. It's a matter of source materials from the past, either literary sources or archaeological sources. And history can be broadly defined as an attempt to collect and interpret uh, the source materials from the past. That's all. Without that, there is no history. And in the collection and interpretation, there can be differing views. That is why the conflicts are there. But unfortunately, uh, many who write on the past uh, have their preconceived notions. They have their own philosophies or ideologies, and they want to put everything into that framework. So, for example, uh, the communists and masses, they think that history is created by class uh, conflicts and class warfare. So, it is the product of classes and class conflicts. Others may think otherwise. Now, this, these preconceived notions uh, make them take only selected things and explain them in their own fashion. That creates opinions. But today, more and more people are interested in knowing what really happened. For that, it's a great effort. And in, in the last two, three centuries, many uh, university faculties in advanced uh, societies have been struggling to create a new subject or a sub-discipline called historical method. How to deal with the facts? How to, not, not the facts, you deal with the sources. How to deal with the literary sources? How to deal with archaeological sources? You have to ask certain questions. For example, if you have a literary document before you, who is the author? What is his um, uh, uh, approach to the past or to the contemporary society? Did he have any vested interest in interpreting things in a certain way? Did he belong to a class? Did he belong to a religious group? Did he belong to a criminal group? So his questions, his, his motives have to be questioned. That is one thing. The time, uh, the period, the language, the style, and the preconceived notions about uh, history which a writer has. This is the beginning. And then there, there, there are things which uh, technically are called external criticism and internal criticism. You have to look for contradictions. You have to, in the statements, you have to look for various uh, meanings of words and concepts which are given there. So different methods are used in order to interpret the documents. And uh, as, as they say, that no two watches agree, no two historians agree about their interpretation. Things are there, but which are the important things? Uh, that depends on the way in which a historian looks at it. So there is quite a uh, vast room for differences. It will always remain. There will be never, any time, anywhere, a, a history which is agreed upon by all the people. That difference, those differences will continue. But there can be some kind of a consensus among learned people, and that is to be done in the universities. Unfortunately, we don't have universities in India. We have only examination centers, no universities. This I learned when I went abroad and worked in the University of London for a year. Their university is, enti is entirely different from what we call a university. Uh, there is no uh, external board of studies, there is no external question setting, there is no secret examination, nothing like that. So it's a different thing. There is only a dialogue between the teachers and the students. It's a continuing dialogue, which we don't have. So we don't have universities, and we don't have authoritative history books also. Then another thing I would very much like to make you aware of is the fact that uh, history textbooks uh, <coughs> to be written by government bodies. This is a new thing in India. Until 1976, when for the first time, uh, the Indian Council of Historical Research decided that um, the NCERT and other bodies have to create 
history books, there was no official government-created uh, history. Historians, professional historians in various teaching institutions wrote their own books, and the teachers used their books, those books, as and when they liked them. That's all. But in 1976, government bodies created history. How can this be? What can, it, what can be the quality of a government-created history? The government-sponsored history will be created by the ruling parties. So when there is a change in the ruling parties, there will be change in the history textbooks also. This goes on. It is very clear from 1976, they created a textbooks. I was also a member of that body, though we didn't like it. We didn't understand this problem. It's, a, uh, it's an anti-democratic process that governments have to create history. But since it was there, we also, we tried to work it out and we found, we tried to find maximum consensus and created some books. But that's a very, that was a very wrong step as far as I can see. History books have to be written by professional historians and they, it go, these uh, controversies and debates, uh, conflicting views, will have to go on. It's an open book. History is never a closed subject and there is no finality about it. This is what I feel. Ah, they say it is five minutes more to start discussion. I see. Um, that's all right. I'm, I'll be stopping now. Now, I, what I, I was saying is that the government attempt to create history by uh, making certain committees write history and prescribe them in government-owned uh, institutions is a wrong move, anti-democratic move, and uh, that was first practiced in a country like Soviet Union, for example. There, uh, they created history. They appointed certain members of a committee and created history, uh, and they, were, they had to change from time to time. Unfortunately, though we call ours a democratic country, this democratic country, Secular Democratic Republic of India, adopted the dictatorial uh, pattern of the Soviet Union, asking government bodies to create uh, textbooks in history. This is a wrong move, and it continues. And uh, this is the source of uh, many of the uh, unhealthy trends in historical teaching now. This is one thing. Another thing is that anybody writes about history. Mostly the journalists write about history uh, without proper knowledge, without study. Uh, they think they can write about it because they, they wanted to create some sensation, exaggerate things as they know, uh, or distort things according to their views, their likes and dislike, uh, dislikes. That means uh, two kinds of history. One is political history, which is not history at all. It's government-sponsored history. Another thing is um, journalistic history, which is again the anti-note uh, of uh, what has to be history in an open society. Thank you all. Esteemed Guru Dr. MGS Narayan, Dr. Saradendu Mukherjee, Dr. Vijayarishmi, Dear students, when I was invited to this function, I readily accepted precisely because I never come here before uh, 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 for such an occasion. The first time I came here before, you know, most of you were born uh, to play cricket in the ground. And this is for the first time that I'm coming here as, a, as an academician. And I'm thankful uh, to the authorities for having invited me. In the IITs, there is a Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, but uh, in the NITs, I don't think there are any. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, your, your knowledge of history would, uh, as a consequence, or social sciences for that matter, uh, would be very uh, limited. I would uh, say that, you know, there is an ascendancy of history in the, uh, in the recent past. And historians have become very important persons. They are assuming a public role. Uh, this is not uh, very strange, because there is a history of everything. History, I would suggest, is the mother of all sciences. 
And uh, so, uh, history cannot be avoided. But recently, history has assumed, it has always been so, a more important political uh, role. Uh, I'll come to that later. But there is a phenomena that we have to take note of. Uh, in the last two decades and more, there are so many people abroad, going abroad, especially the number of uh, technocrats, please don't get offended, uh, in America, uh, more than uh, doubled in the last two uh, decades. And their understanding of history is very limited. Their understanding is limited to TV serials or graphics, uh, you know, Amar Chitra Katha and uh, things like that, uh, which are very, very wrong. Uh, so, history has become a, a kind of part of uh, uh, what I would call heritage industry. It has become part of heritage industry, which is very unfortunate. But I will not elaborate because I don't have the uh, time. If there are questions after the uh, session, I would be glad to respond. Uh, the trouble with TV serials is that, take for example, uh, I am a uh, historian trying to specialize in modern India, so I shall confine myself to modern period. Uh, take for example the serial on Rani Lashmi Bhai. Uh, Rani Lashmi Bhai, I would personally say, one of the greatest uh, persons in the modern period, very brave. Uh, Colonel Hugh Rose, who opposed her, you know, uh, said that here lies the only man among the rebels and all that. I'm not going into that. But if you see the serial, you would think that, you know, as a, even as a small child of five-year-old, she was imbued with a kind of very patriotic fervor, anti-Ferengi feeling and all that, which is not the case at all. You see, uh, from 1855, when the doctrine of lapse was uh, implemented, to 1857, when she, when she chose to revolt, she spent two years sending her Dubashi or interpreter to the British councillors, trying for a negotiated settlement. Only when that avenue was closed did she choose to fight. And when she fought, she fought like anything. She was a very brave, had the bravest of her, the very great military strategist and all that. I'm not going to that. That's another point. So uh, one has to be very aware of this uh, distorted understanding of history gained through graphics or through TV Serials. That is the first point that I have to make as a professional historian. By professional historian, I mean a person who makes a livelihood by, through history. Now, history as a heritage industry has its own defaults and its own uh, demerits to which I am not going. Now, but there are, because of heritage industry, uh, persons who are self-appointed as historians. They are self-nominated as historians. So now, as you, uh, as you can see, everybody is a historian, which is not the case, because history has a methodology, history has a science, and history has historiography, which is more important. So a person who is not aware of this would, be, uh, would not be the person to uh, sit in judgment on anything. But uh, I'm not for want of time going into the details. Dr. Sharadindu Mukherjee's intervention, if I understand him rightly, uh, dwelt on two things. One, broadly put, the role of individuals in history. And two, the role of textbooks in pedagogy. Uh, I, I, I would submit that I have some differences with him on this count. I don't think that individuals are, you know, persons who can turn history around. Individuals don't make history. Social groups do. And history is about change. If there is no change, there is no history. And history is not just about a, a recounting of the past. It is about a reconstruction of the past, a reinterpretation of the past from known evidences. If evidences are not known, there is no history. When my grandfather studied history, he did not know about the whole civilization, which now we call Indus Valley civilization, Mohanjadaro or Harappa. It was not known. Nobody knew about Ashoka the Great. So, known evidences are very important. And how do you interpret these known evidences? That is more important. Uh, now, uh, to, to, to cite an example, all history is contemporary history. 
A historian is writing from, from this, you know, if I am writing history from 2017, I'd be influenced by the prevalent notions, prevalent ideas, ideologies. That is, that is there. To cite an example, we are now celebrating the 100 years of the uh, Russian Revolution, also called Bolshevik Revolution, uh, uh, October or November Revolution, etc. Trotsky was a participant in this revolution. He wrote a monumental book, a three-volumed book on history of the Russian Revolution, a monumental work. But there is very little mention of women in that book. Women constituted 40% of the working class, the proletariat at that time, not the, pot, not, not the population. 40% of the proletariat, the working class, in 1917. And there were women leaders, trade union leaders. But Trotsky is, you know, he's not mentioning about them. You can call him a male chauvinist pig. He was writing at a time when his notions were patriarchal and governed by his patriarchal ideology. So he was not deliberately omitting women from history. He was writing naturally. This, this point was raised in 17, uh, 1989, when uh, the, the 200th bicentennial of French Revolution was uh, being celebrated. What, what role did women play in the revolution? Women were just eased out, erased out, or marginalized. To cite another example, there is now an interpretation uh, uh, by Badri Narayan and other Dalit historians about the role of Jansi Rani. They say that Jansi Rani what, did not want to fight. She was instigated to fight by her Pasi. Pasi is a Dalit caste, uh, woman Jalkari Bhai, who was her childhood playmate, who instigated her to fight. And when Mayavadi became the chief minister of uh, UP, she tried to renovate this and to find out the role of Dalit women in 1857 uprising. There were small shrines called Virangana shrines. These were renovated by Mayavadi all over UP for her own political gains. This I would cite as an instance of political use or abuse of history. But the point is that while she was having a political gain in mind, she was also doing a service to historiography because Dalits have been erased, marginalized. Women have been erased, marginalized. So how do you listen to women? Why women became silent? These are questions that we should raise. To cite another example, I shall uh, uh, stop with that. Uh, in the annual historiography of French uh, scholars, a person called Ari wrote about childhood, a century of childhood. He stated that there were no children. There were infants and there were young people. He cited the absence of child portraits, illustrations, etc. He also made use of a very good source, not a traditional source like you find in archives, but the diary of Madame Bellard, a washerwoman. She was a washerwoman whose diary was found accidentally. Ari found that in the clothes mentioned in the, in the list of clothes that she has washed, there was not a single mention of a child, uh, a, a, a special clothes for child, worn by children. I visited uh, uh, SM Street about 50 years back as my child. There were no shops for children. There were shops selling clothes where we go, buy clothes, get it stitched according to our sizes by a tailor, that's it. But if you go to SM Street now, there are so many shops exclusively selling children wear. Kiddies Corner, the name is very indicative. This is the change over the last quarter of 50 years. You know, this is the change that we should be aware of. So, history should always be uh, asking questions and be aware of change. History would always be interpretative. It is never an empirical narrative. It's not telling a story. You can't tell a story. 
there are there are uh, writers for for that let uh, uh, charles dickens write about a tale of two cities where even there madame defarge is you know very very stout woman and she plays a very important role uh, in the revolution you know those of you who have read uh, charles dickens tale of city would would uh, readily agree with me so even these are important literature as a source of history and myths legends as source of history these are all to be reevaluated reinterpreted and integrated into the I main uh, about textbooks as a pedagogy should we depend on textbooks this is the point that raised uh, by dr m g s narayan why should textbooks be why should pedagogy be based on textbooks i shall tell you briefly about you know that historiography has to be told the first issue came in 1977 when a new ministry came in delhi a secret uh, a highly confidential note was given to the then uh, education minister chandar chundar and since it was a very confidential highly confidential note we in jnu got it i was a research scholar in jnu at that time uh, got it within half an hour and we got it uh, cyclo style because you know f uh, the the, the uh, photostat machines have not come into xeroxing and cyclo styling was the uh, method of duplication we got it uh, xeroxed and uh, circulated it the idea was to withdraw the textbooks written by bipin chandra r s sharma romala thapar and others and in bipin chandra's textbooks you don't find gandhi being Uh, uh you know relegated to a high exalted position at all not at all and i would say that you know bipin chandra's book at that time now it has become outdated in 1977 was one of the best textbooks you can find still it was sought to be withdrawn why because there was a politics involved in it and that's precisely the political abuse of history that we should talk about because there is now a political uh, a struggle going on an ideological struggle going on when dr sharadindu is saying that you know one has to be devoid of ideology that itself is an ideological question ideology is basically what ideologically basically a way of looking at the world and taking a position thank you my respected teachers and my dear friends uh, we have been listening to uh, three kinds of uh, opinions uh, each well almost well substantiated also then first of all uh, uh, i will say something about uh, uh, dr mukherjee's talk uh, that the first thing that struck me from his talk is this that is there is something pleasant and uh, unpleasant what is pleasant and unpleasant in history there is no nothing that is uh, pleasant and nothing that is unpleasant certain things will be pleasant to somebody and some other things will be uh, uh, unpleasant to them that's all and there is no room for value judgment in history we are not the person to judge uh we can judge a historical work but uh, the the question of judging a historical personality uh, it needs more time it needs more space and judgment is not an easy thing then history is not uh, merely what has happened in the past it is not so it is our culture it is the culture itself for example you people may be studying uh, technology but we know that uh, no uh, that is the greatest number of inventions took place in the neolithic age and nothing has surpassed the neolithic invention we are not in a position to do away with uh, those things uh, which were invented by our forefathers who were living in the neolithic age or the new stone age then in history uh, what i have to say is this that is uh, there are two kinds of history that is one is popular history and other is popularized history popular history is not so dangerous but popularized history is very dangerous if we want to achieve something 
take the medium of history and then they will popularize it. Then people who are not so much aware of what has happened or what is being written down by the so-called historians is correct or not, they will believe that popularized history and it is the popularized history that destroy the present generation and the generation to come also. Then another thing is that you, if you want to study science and technology, you must study at least the history of science and technology. And if to study the history of science and technology, you must study the societal aspect. What was the uh, societal needs that were behind this uh, uh, particular science and technology? For example, in your history of technology or in the history of uh, science and technology that is being taught in, uh, in Kerala, there is no mention of the great contributions of medieval Kerala astronomers and mathematicians. And they have proved that even a highly technical aspect like technical, the technological branch like astronomy cannot be completely true. And our great Vadasheri Parameswaran, the great astronomer of the 15, 16th century, has repeatedly said that I have dedicated my whole life for experimenting, for seeing and conducting ex um, this, uh, experimentations. But I am not sure that I am correct. But I am, I am sure of one thing, that is the present, the coming generation would study my teachings and they would correct it and they would supplement it. And uh, that was true history, that was true science. And history is a science just like mathematics also is a science. That is, it is a branch of knowledge that is capable of being falsified. Today's truth may not be the truth of tomorrow. It will be, it, 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 it will be corrected or it will be supplemented. Then and then only it will be a science. And so history also is a science. Then I am asked to wind up within a few minutes. I will do so. And uh, regarding the, the thrust area was freedom fight. And there was a mention of uh, Subhash Bos. And we all know that uh, uh, we have studied about Simon D. Monfort's uh, parliament. We admire Simon D. Monfort not because of the things he had done, but uh, what was the parliament he set up. So also, this uh, INA is to be measured in terms of the inspiration it instilled in the minds of the Indians. Not, at all, no, not only to the contemporary people, but to the uh, coming, but in the minds of the coming generations also. Then, uh, one more thing, uh, many more things, but one thing to pinpoint is this. Our idea of the past, it is not of the past as a whole, but it is of the sources alone. You can write history only banking on the sources. Otherwise, it will be a guesswork. History is not a guesswork. And we know that we are very much proud of the great Indus Valley civilization or the Harappan civilization. But we people are not in a position to decipher what they have written down. And if it is successful, if the decipherment is successful, we will be forced to change our views on this uh, great Indus Valley civilization. So also we know that, uh, uh, now we know that uh, there was a great, great king called Ashoka and we know about his contribution and all these things. But until the advent of the British, we do not know that there was such a great king. 
right? Uh, when the British epigraphists brought before us, or when they read for us what all things were written by Ashoga, we came to know of Ashoga. This uh, history is like a sieve. Everything is submerged there. And uh, whenever we get an opportunity, or whenever we are we are becoming fortunate to have newer and newer sources, we will have better histories. History will go on changing because uh, this many voices, many voices is the soul of history. History is not a monolithic structure. It, it is built of various uh, theories, various aspects, various cultures and the like. And uh, it is not minimize history to the certain uh, textbooks or textbook give you certain precise ideas. Since textbooks are meant for students, the writing of textbooks must be uh, with utmost care. Otherwise, the mind of the student will, be, will get uh, contaminated. So we have to differentiate between popular history, popularized history, history from textbooks, history from opinions and the like. It goes on like, th like this. And uh, uh, that is uh, MGS Narayanan's ideas on uh, India, India as a nation. This is the concept of nation. It also is changing and we do not know what all things make happen in the coming decades because uh, uh, this nation, nationality, nationhood, etc., all these are invented aspects. Yesterday's nationalism is not today's nationalism. Then uh, historian, as Professor Gobalanguti uh, reminded us, historians has a public role also. Otherwise, he is very vigilant. He is very vigilant with regard to what all uh, happening in the present. Without the past, you cannot read present. Uh, you cannot make an edifice in the edifice of the future also. With these words, I stop and all these are